So now, back to prospect theory. And we said last time, prospect theory is to some degree going to be the behavioral economics equivalent or answer to or response to more traditional expected utility theory that it's an alternative way of trying to describe how people think about decision making under uncertainty or under risk. And because some of these findings and what this prospect theory tries to model is so pervasive in our empirical evidence, this really forms sort of the cornerstone of behavioral economics overall, which is why we talk about it first. So, you know, if we think about our traditional model of risky choice, so I put a little review materials up online, like I said I would, but we can also just do a quick exercise here to remind you what we're all talking about, okay? So we have this traditional model of risky choice, just to remind you what's going on, where we talk about utility as a function of wealth, right? And we say, all right, we've got some sort of wealth level W. And we say, well, we get some utility from that wealth, call it U of W. And we say, generally speaking, maybe not always, but generally speaking, our utility function looks something like this. So it's concave down. And we say it looks like this because, you know, we know in most contexts, for most people, people are risk averse. And this model is a risk averse individual. We say that we can justify this presumption that most people are risk averse most of the time by showing that people are going to have this type of utility whenever they have diminishing marginal utility of wealth, right? Because if this is our utility function, our marginal utility is just the slope. And we can obviously see that the slope gets smaller as we get to higher levels of wealth. So really the only assumption we've made to get to this point is to say, well, if you have zero wealth, you get zero utility from that. That doesn't seem particularly controversial. In addition, that first dollar was more useful to you than, say, the millionth dollar. Again, doesn't seem particularly controversial if for no other reason than that first dollar kept you from starving. That millionth dollar, you're like, eh, you know, throw it on the pile. Maybe I'll find something I want to buy with it. Maybe not. Right? So we think about this, and then we say, how do we use this framework, which is not particularly controversial, <coughs> at least not yet, how do we use this framework to analyze how we would feel about a particular, you know, what we consider a risk or a gamble? And we can think of a very simple example. Let's just say I flip a coin. And if the coin comes up heads, I'll give you $100. If the coin comes up tails, I'll give you $0. So we obviously know in that situation you're going to get $100 with probability 0.5, you're going to get $0 with probability 0.5. Easy. For the sake of simplicity, and this should be perhaps actually, you know, approximately realistic for the grad students in the audience here, let's just say that your existing level of wealth is zero for now, just because it makes the math easier. Okay. Then we could say, well, we can we can show the utility we get from zero, right? Say like 100 is out here. We could say, you know, here's our utility of 100. And then we could say, you know, just our expected value is obviously 50, right? Just 0.5 times 100 plus 0.5 times zero. So on average, you're going to get $50 out of this bet. And then we know that our expected utility is then just 0.5 times the utility of zero plus 0.5 times the utility we get from 100. And we also know that we can represent this graphically if we have a line segment between these two places. The expected utility is actually the point on the line segment that corresponds to the expected value. So the expected utility of our gamble is actually here. Now this also explains why most people, if given the option, you know, you could either have this coin flip, where you're either getting zero or 100, or I could just hand you 
most people would take the $50. And we can see why. You say, well, the utility of 50 is just what we see on our utility graph at 50. And we can see as long as a person is risk averse, as long as a person has diminishing marginal utility of wealth, their utility function is going to look like this. And it will be the case that the utility of that $50 for sure is going to be above the expected utility of the gamble. Mm -hmm. So the straight line, is that risk neutral? Or? Yeah, so if the person was instead risk neutral, their utility function would look like a straight line. And then we would say, well, it's not then surprising that they're indifferent between the gamble and the certain outcome. Because if the utility function were a straight line, they'd just be right on top of each other. Right? And you can even think about a person who has risk-loving preferences. Those are the ones where the utility function is concave up. This would exactly be backwards. right? That if you were to think about this line segment, the point representing expected utility would be above the point on the utility function itself, indicating that the person would prefer the gamble to this certain outcome, to this you know, expected value for sure which is exactly what risk-loving implies. Right? Yeah. And the reason that this works here, the reason we can just draw this line segment is simply because of the way you know, line segments work, that we're saying that this is just our expected utility here. If you think about how to find you know, the midpoint of a line or any point along a line, it's just going to be some sort of weighted average, which is exactly what we're doing here, that we're taking the utility of zero at zero is one endpoint, the utility of 100 at 100 is the other point, and then just basically finding a weighted average of those two points. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what if you don't start at zero, would you still be more willing to take the $50 guaranteed? Yeah, and we're going to see, we're actually going to see an example of that as we go forward. We're going to show the difference between this and what prospect theory would imply, and we're in fact going to do an example where we're not starting at zero. Graphically, you can see here, you know, just move this point up a little bit, right? Just start him somewhere on that utility curve that's not zero. You can still see that the line segment is going to be below the curve itself. Yeah, so you're going to get the same thing. Let's try to make it easy for starters. Okay. So here, the important thing to take away from this, in addition to what we just said, was that this utility function is defined over levels of wealth, or final states of the world, right? That here, I said, you know, if we're assuming that we currently have a wealth level of zero and we add this bet onto it, then your possibilities for your final levels of wealth is either going to be zero or 100. If I had said instead, you currently have a net worth of a million dollars, technically speaking, the traditional economic model says, well, then you just incorporate this gamble into your existing net worth, and the gamble is actually a 50% chance of ending up with a final net worth of a million dollars, a 50% chance of ending up with a final net worth of a million and one hundred dollars. Okay. That the simplification here that we started with a net worth of zero is the only reason that we're starting at this order. Okay. 